a force to be reckoned with. Griselda Blanco, aka the Cocaine Godmother, the Black Widow, and female Tony Montana. A drug lord of the Medellin cartel who reigned terror on Miami for nearly five decades, from the 1950s to the early 2000s. DEA agent Bob Palumbo explained, I don't think the fact that she was a female trying to prove something had anything to do with her violent behavior. I just think it was inherent to Griselda Blanco. This goes back to her life, the way she was brought up. She was just a violent person. Thank you for choosing to watch another one of our awesome videos. To enjoy more of these videos, subscribe to our channel to be a part of the money gang, and click the notification bell to get a front row seat. Today we're learning about the life and death of Griselda the Godmother Blanco. The cocaine godmother firmly established fear in major male crime figures via heartless violence. It's estimated that she's in charge of roughly 200 murders whilst trafficking drugs from Colombia to Miami, New York, and California. Her power, her bloody tactics, her lavish lifestyle, her cold-heartedness, and her ability to run up a staggering net worth of $2 billion in a field that has always been dominated by men are some of the things that Blanco will be remembered for. Born in 1943 in Cartagena, Colombia, she grew up in poverty, and her life of crime reportedly began at an early age. At age 11, there were some accounts saying that she joined her group of friends in kidnapping a 10-year-old boy from a rich family. The boy was held hostage as a group tried to obtain ransom money from his family. When it was clear that the family was not willing to give up the cash, Griselda was handed a gun, and she shot the boy. Violence was presented from the beginning of her life, and had followed her into adulthood. Griselda ran away from home at the age of 14 to escape the abuse at the hands of her mother's boyfriend. She survived by earning money as a pickpocket and a prostitute. When she was 20, she married Alberto Bravo, her second husband, who introduced her to the cocaine trade. She became involved with Colombia's infamous Medellin cartel helping to push Colombian cocaine throughout the United States, specifically to New York, Miami, and Southern California. When you have to smuggle large quantities of cocaine across a border a month, it pays to be creative to avoid being noticed. She transformed the business by developing her own line of underwear with secret sections to stuff the assets into. In Colombia, she opened her own manufacturing factory that produced custom-made bras and girdles that were perfect for their illegal business. Can you imagine having underwear with hidden pockets so that her cocaine mules could get the drugs into the US? The triumph of their narcotics empire put her on the FBI's alert, making her move to Miami. When they hit Miami, the timing was just right and she soon had a monopoly. By the late 1970s, at the peak of her game, she was earning around $80 million a month. Everyone wants to work for her, and the DEA estimated that she had 600 people on her payroll. It was going so well for the godmother that it was only a matter of time before the competitors started to invade her dominion. One of those rivals was the king of cocaine, Escobar. He had become the biggest threat to her business, even though she mentored him from the start. The two were at war, and they wanted each other dead. So started a deadly game of assassins, as they both deployed members of their own drug cartels to kill the other. It was chaotic and messy. Blanco's continued involvement in the Colombian drug trade led to her involvement in several other crimes, including drive-by shootings and other murders motivated by drugs, money, and power. By the late 1970s, detectives had linked her to dozens of murders, but she always managed to run away from the authorities. One of the most scandalous murders was of a two-year-old Johnny Castro, who was in the car with his father, Jesus Chucho Castro. Blanco had ordered the killing of Chucho because he had disrespected her son. As the U.S. Drug Enforcement Agency was on Blanco's trail as part of the far-reaching investigation termed Operation Banshee, in 1975, after authorities seized a reported 150 kilograms of cocaine, Blanco and more than 30 of her partners were summoned on federal drug conspiracy charges. 
A special agent of the Drug Enforcement Administration, Charles Cecil, began investigating Blanco's whereabouts. The DEA issued an escapee report on Blanco and listed it in the National Criminal Information System. However, she had already fled to Colombia by that point, but it wasn't long before she returned to the US, this time settling in Miami. Backed by such brutality and sharp cunning, she became one of the world's wealthiest drug lords. She also embraced her delinquent persona, notably naming one of her sons Michael Corleone after a crime boss in the Godfather series. She also relished a lavish lifestyle that included luxury homes and hedonistic parties. Fearing for her life, Blanco moved to California in 1984. However, her luck finally ran out a year later. After escalating the search and investigation of her, the DEA finally arrested Blanco in Irvine, California on February 17, 1985. She was arrested without bail in her home where she was found reading the Bible in her bedroom. She gave a false name to the DEA agents who arrested her and she was found to be carrying false identification papers. Her trial ended with a conviction on one account of conspiracy to manufacture, import and distribute cocaine. Despite being accused of several killings, she escaped murder charges and was sentenced to 15 years behind bars. You know how people say old habits die hard? The old lady can't quit. She continued successfully to run her cocaine empire from prison. One interesting note from Blanco's case happened in 1994, after one of her hitmen, George Ayala, agreed to testify against her. She was charged with three murders. Prosecutors were pursuing the death penalty, but the key witness's credibility was questioned when it was revealed that he had been having phone sex with secretaries in the prosecuting attorney's office. With the key witness now useless, the state didn't have enough evidence. People are saying that Ayala purposefully wrecked himself as a star witness so that he wouldn't be murdered by one of Blanco's henchmen. In 1998, Blanco ultimately pled guilty in exchange for a reduced sentence, and six years later she was released and deported to Colombia. It was reported that she retired from her life of crime. At the age of 69, the godmother was murdered in Medellin, Colombia. According to news, two gunmen on motorcycle shot Blanco twice in the head after she exited a butcher shop. Can you picture how she was murdered by her own ruthless method? As she was lying dead on the ground, her daughter-in-law placed a Bible on her chest. Griselda Blanco had finally fallen casualty to the same fate that she had forced on so many others. Have you watched her biopic movie titled The Cocaine Godmother? What are your thoughts around it? About how she lived her life? Let me know in the comments section below and I will be responding to all comments in the first hour. If this story is interesting to you, then you will enjoy watching our recent video on Pablo Escobar. Peace.